All right, so we're moving into this chapter, chapter 11, dealing with heat exchangers. This is a very practical, useful chapter. I would say I get the students that will come back after they pass this class, if they have any questions for me about where they're working for the summer or what they saw out there in practice, a lot of it deals with heat exchangers. And then they want to ex understand why this was happening or wh why did when we did this in the factory or in the plant, this happened this way. It relates back to heat exchangers. So we're going to talk about a number of topics. Let's just jump into it. So first of all, concentric tube heat exchanger. It is uh, better or easier to analyze concentric tube heat exchangers. You do find a few of them in practice, but they're not that many in practice. But we start with things that we can analyze and then move to the more complex, which are more difficult. Maybe we have to use empirical results for the more complex uh, heat exchangers. So a concentric tube is just like what it says. You have a tube, and then you have another tube, and they're aligned. One is on the outside, one is in the inside. And so you may have fluid flowing. Maybe it's hot fluid flowing in the inner tube. And in the shell region, you have fluid flowing either in the same direction or in the opposite direction in that annulus region. I like to draw them like this. And I'll talk about the hot side and the cold side. And we could have the fluid coming in, the temperature hot coming in. And we could have the temperature hot going out. There's a bunch of questions I can ask today, but this is kind of basic stuff. In general, if I have a heat exchanger, I have a hot fluid and a cold fluid passing through it, would I expect the temperature hot in to be greater than the temperature hot out or less than or equal to? I mean, I'm not going to do this as a clicker question, but this is a type of question that we want to start answering in your own mind. Well, which one is the higher temperature? The hot end. Because if there's a heat transfer in the heat exchanger, it's going to go from the hot to the cold fluid. And when it goes from the hot to the cold fluid, the temperature of the hot fluid goes down, unless there's a phase change. We'll get to phase change. But for now, majority of this le lecture, if not all of this lecture, we're just talking about something without phase change. It's just going to stay a liquid or stay a gas. All right. What about the cold, the temperature of the cold in? versus the temperature of the cold out. Which one is higher? The cold out. Yeah, it gained heat in the heat exchanger. OK. There's other types of heat exchangers. Maybe you have a tube. Uh, maybe I'll show it like this. And another tube. Show it like that. And another tube. There's just a bunch of tubes. And there's an array of tubes. And then you have fluid flowing over and across perpendicular to the axis of the tube. So you have maybe the hot fluid flowing through the tubes and the cold fluid flowing across the tubes. That would be a cross-flow heat exchanger. You put fins on the tubes to connect them, and it looks like an automobile radiator. And we studied fin conduction before. We had the first project on fin conduction associated with a lot of radiators. OK. We're not going to cover all the heat exchangers. We're going to analyze especially that concentric tube heat exchanger. But we also want to cover a shell and tube heat exchanger. So let me kind of say that you would have a big shell. And you could have different configurations on this. You could have a shell with a cap on the end. And the cap on the end has a port in which fluid can enter. And maybe it has a plate right here, and another plate down here, and another end down here. And maybe the, it's a bunch of tubes that, are, that just go through such that the fluid that enters here can enter one of the tubes. Let me see. I'll show it like this. And go and pass through the tube. It will be a straight run gets to the end, dumps out. Maybe it's a manifold or something like that. It's where it can mix. And then it's a subject to another bunch of tubes. And they can re-enter another tube. 
and go out. Maybe you have a plate that splits here, prevents the short circuiting and another outlet. And so the fluid eventually goes in and leaves on the same end. Pretty convenient. You could unbolt this and uh, maybe put in a tube cleaner. Maybe every couple of years clean that heat exchanger because there'll be some fouling, some deposit of unwanted material inside the tubes. Let's get to that later. Let me just kind of get through some introductory concepts. Uh, we'll get to practical issues in a minute. Well, this was maybe the hot fluid, the temperature hot in and the temperature hot out. The cold, you could have a bunch of different configurations. Maybe the cold is going to come on the shell side, come in here. Maybe the temperature cooled in. And maybe for convenience in the plant, you want the cold to come out. So kind of all the inlet and outlet pipes are on one end. But this one's feeding the shell side. And in your design, what you want to do is force the flow to come in, go across the tubes, go across the tubes, 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 across the tubes. You can kind of see the pattern here. How would you accomplish that? Well, maybe introduct introduce something that blocks the flow from short circuiting there and then introduce uh, things that would force the flow across the tubes true you know and this would be a very common type of configuration for a shell and tube heat exchanger so on the shell side you're forcing that flow across the tubes. Now, I've shown, what, two tubes? You could put 50 tubes in there. You could put, I don't know, a pile of tubes in there. I mean, you're trying to draw it in 2D, but there's a lot of tubes you can put in there. And so you envision the pathway in that. And this is these are baffles, as you might expect, things to force the flow to go where you want it. All right. So shell and tube. Well, here you're going to reply, imp, uh, rely more on empirical results for something as complicated as a shell and tube heat exchanger, where for the concentric tube, we can analyze it more uh, analytically. Okay, so the overall heat transfer coefficient, a new parameter. But if you have a wall that separates the two materials, on one side, maybe it's the hot side, and on the other side, it's the cold side. And I want to analyze heat transfer at that location through the wall from the hot to the cold fluid. First, I have to get it out of the hot fluid and to the wall on the hot side. Then I have to get it through that wall. Then I have to get it back into the cold fluid. So there's three resistances to the heat transfer. Two are convective. One is conductive. So I'll have a 1 over H and the A. Both of these are inside. I have the thickness L of the wall, the thermal conductivity of the wall, and then the area of the wall, L over K, A, conduction through that wall. And then 1 over H on the cold side, maybe I should have put it outside or cold side, area outside. Those three resistors are in series or parallel? Series, so if I want the overall resistance, do I just sum up the three values? Yeah, so if I said the sum of those R's is the equivalent resistance. Now, sometimes those three areas are exactly the same. Sometimes they're not because there's curvature and whatever. But, but just leave it with the A's like this. Well, then somebody says, what I'd like to do is just have one simple model, which is 1 over UA. What is U? U is the overall heat transfer coefficient. What's it defined as? By this equation, which is 1 over HA on the inside, or the hot side, or whatever side that is, plus the L over KA for the wall, plus 1 over HA for the other side, the outside, the cold side, something. Now, you can manipulate this equation more, but that's probably good enough for the introduction. What, what it, how is this defined? U is defined such that it accounts for the two convective plus the conductive resistance to heat transfer. All right. Every now and then you'll see that, well, the coefficient is based on the outer area. Oh, no, the coefficient's based on the inner area. When the area is different, sometimes you have to read carefully. What is the U 
What, what is the area associated with that U? The overall is the coefficient, but I have to pick, is it the area on the inside or the area on the outside? As if it's just a plain wall, they have the same area. All right. Well, not only can you have the fluids flowing through and you have the convective resistance, if you wait long enough, some of those fluids will actually deposit some stuff on the sides which will inhibit or degrade the heat transfer. It'll be an additional resistance. It's called a fouling, fouling of that heat exchanger. So you would have the convective, then you'd have some fouling, then you'd have some conductive, then maybe another fouling, and then convective out to the fluid again. T infinity or T infinity here, T hot, T cold. And so this was a 1 over HA. This is a 1 over HA. This is an L over KA. We just added these. And so you say, how do they model it? Well, you could have modeled it 1 over some sort of fouling convection coefficient area. No, not in this book. They introduce a big R double prime. Okay, so here's my question for you. Uh, instead of putting it right here, that's not the answer. I, I, I need to know what is my resistance due to that fouling. Is it just R double prime, answer A, clicker question, or is it R double prime times my area for that inside or outside, that's answer B, or is it R double prime divided by A, answer C. Do you see the three choices? Let's go ahead and start that. All right, let's go ahead and stop. Okay, for those that uh, did it correctly, um, and C is the correct answer, how did you know that C was the right answer? How did you check your units? So. What do we know about the uh, units of uh, 1 over HA? What are the SI units for the resistance associated with 1 over HA? Well, if you didn't work on it for a while, the H is watts per meter squared temperature change. And then the area is meter squared. So, oh yeah, now I remember all of these R's have units degree C or degree K. It's a temperature change divided by watts of transfer through it. So I know that this R right here has to have units degree C or Kelvin per watt. True? Is that what went through your mind? Yeah. And so you look up here and you say, well, this is going to be R double prime. They show me the units up here. It's meter squared Kelvin per watt. Let's see. Do I multiply by meter squared? Multiply by area? No. Do nothing? No. Divide by meter squared? Yeah. And so that's how C comes to be the right answer. And again, to me, it's just like this double prime when we talked about contact resistance. And that, to me, is confusing. I wish they didn't have the double prime up there on that R. I kind of wish they would have just reported it as uh, 1 over H uh, fouling or something like that. It would be easier, I think, in, to my mind. Anyway, you have both the fouling here, and you could have different fouling on other sides. When you see data like this, how well is this data known? How many significant digits is this number reported to? Clicker question. Is it reported to 1, 2, 3, four or five significant digits. Answer A, B, C, D, or E. What can I say? Have I been trying to hide information and knowledge from you? What part of the equation am I letting you down with? Too many options, huh? That was it. <laughs> there was a way that you could pin it back on me, and that's okay. All right, I need to move on. So we have uh, already added and adjusted and in 
change the u based on adding the following factor. What was the equation again? 1 over ua is equal to 1 over the ha. Maybe this is on one side. We have the 1 over ha on the outside. We have this 1 over, I can't remember, is this r double prime divided by a? Is that what we concluded that should be? Yeah. And then we had the l over ka, and then we had the r double prime divided by a. Okay. Without any fouling, no fouling, those go away. If the convection coefficient on one of the sides goes up, increases, and everything else stays the same, the thickness, the conductivity of the metal, the convection coefficient on the other side, what happens? How does U change? Does U go up as well, stay about the same, no change, or go down, answer A, B, or C? And this is the new one, I, D, K. Yeah, let's go ahead and stop this. So if the H goes up, what happens to this group of terms right here? Let's say that's the H that changes. If it goes up, what happens to that group of terms? It goes down. The rest of these constants stay the same, but because that one term went down and the rest of them stayed constant, does this term have to go down or up to match? Has to go down, has to go down. And we're not changing area to make uh, the 1 over UA go down. What does U have to do? has to go up. What's the right answer? A, let's grade it. Hey, that's pretty good. I need to ask harder questions. Seriously, this previous question was uh, not even a t-ball question, right? I mean, it was so easy. Oh, too many options. That's right. I gave you too many options. That's why you didn't do well. Now, let's move to a harder one. The same game, what happens if R double prime starts to come in? If there's no fouling, you can think of R double prime as zero, true? But let's say we start to get more and more fouling. More and more fouling, what does that do to the overall heat transfer coefficient? Does it increase it? Answer A. No change? Answer B. Or does it decrease it? Answer C. Or I don't know? Answer D. Let's go ahead and stop this, and let's jump into it. So uh, if the resistance goes up, the overall heat transfer is degraded. Uh, if, you, if you want a good heat, heat exchanger, you want to promote heat transfer inside a heat exchanger, usually heat exchangers are not introduced to insulate things, but to promote the transfer, not to degrade the transfer of heat. So fouling is bad and often they have to stop, take it out of service, and clean it to get the fouling eradicated and get it back in the service. So what's good, a high U is typically considered good. A high overall convective heat transfer coefficient is good to promote heat transfer. Makes sense. Let's press, press forward. So we have a temperature distribution and a concentric tube heat exchanger with parallel flow. So the way I sketched the, the, the uh, concentric tube is just to separate the hot fluid from the cold fluid. And so we're going to have parallel flow. You could have either parallel or counter flow in the concentric tube heat exchanger. If you have parallel flow, do you think that both of them flow in the same direction? You think that's it? And then counter flow, what's going to happen? One of them is going to go in the opposite direction. So this would be the temperature hot in. This would be the temperature hot out. This would be the temperature cold in. This would be the temperature cold out. True. Now, let's say we start the heat exchanger at x equal to 0, and we end it at x equal to L, and this is the direction of x. You have a longer heat exchanger, larger L. And we're going to plot as a function of x going from 0 to L, temperatures. So let's go ahead and put the highest temperature that we see out there. It's T hot N. What is the lowest of the four temperatures? What's the lowest of these four temperatures? The cold N. That'll be the lowest of the low. 
the temperature cold in. Now, if you look at it, we're going to do the differential equations and get a mathematical rigorous treatment, but I'm just building up to that, having a conceptual introduction to heat exchangers. So when you first look at that first couple inches in that heat exchanger, you have a large delta T to promote a more rapid or a larger Q, a higher Q. So what's going to happen is, is you're going to cool off the hot fluid pretty rapidly and heat up the cold fluid pretty rapidly. But then the delta T drops, doesn't it? And so the rate at which the hot fluid heats up and the cold fluid, I'm sorry, cold fluid, hot fluid cools down and cold fluid heats up, decreases that rate. And so there's a sequence of curves for the hot fluid and a sequence of curves for the cold fluid. Does that look reasonable? that look reasonable? All right. Somebody asked, well, if you make this heat exchanger a little longer, do you ever think that you could get the cold fluid and the hot fluid to sort of swap? No. No. Why not? Look, well, what out here, what would happen? You'd have your delta T and you would drive the heat transfer, but what started out to be the cold fluid is now the hot fluid. It's not going to work. They're going to exponentially get closer. If you make it longer, well, they'll just sort of slow down and, and get a little, little closer together. True? That's what we'd expect. Somebody asked, what is Q then for this heat exchanger? Q would be how many watts is transferred out of the hot and into the cold. How could I calculate Q, especially how could I relate it to the temperature hot in minus the temperature hot out? I want to pause and I want you to finish this equation. Where I put an underline, put in there what should be there. What is, from the perspective of the hot fluid, finish this equation. And you can then write Q is equal to something times T cold out minus T cold in. It won't be the same thing that's missing. This is what's missing. That's what's missing. They're not the same thing. They're slightly, they're related. They're, they're similar, but they're different. I want you to fill in those two equations while I walk around and see if you're with me. So a lot of people wanted to put in something like UA. Eh, yeah, not going to work, is it? And then some people put in, uh, oh, the mass flow rate specific heat of the hot fluid. And now those that put in the mass flow rate specific heat of the hot fluid, uh, why? Why did you do that? Why did, why did you know that's the right answer? It's thermal one. It's an energy balance. Write EB. Have I ever emphasized EB for something? Don't forget, energy is conserved. You can do an energy balance. First law of thermo. Kind of had that experience for a while here now, right? But you're saying, hey, what, what happened to the enthalpy? It's the mass flow rate times the change in the enthalpy. That's true. That's why we put a CP delta T. When we're talk, talking about liquids or gases not changing phase, we could talk more about enthalpies later when we get the phase change. All right, but uh, M dot C sub P, how about down here? M dot C sub P of the cold fluid. If I leave off any subscript on the specific heat, it's typically assumed a constant pressure. But for a liquid or an incompressible substance, there's no difference. <coughs> CP is equal to CB is equal to C. <coughs> Uh, you're talking about if I kind of cut right here and then took a look, I would have a, I would have this, and I'm assuming that the hot fluid, I'm talking about the bulk fluid temperature, the mean fluid temperature of th that flowing in that uh, section, and the mean fluid temperature flowing in that section. And that's why you just yeah, instead of drawing a cold on top again, I just simplify it, just thinking about heat transfer from one side to the other, from the inside to the outside that help? Yeah. Okay. Now, uh, somebody says, 
I'm going to leave the mass flow rate of the cold fluid, and I'm going to not change the fluids. So the specific heats are not going to change, and I'm not going to change the mass flow rate of the cold fluid. But I'm going to crank up the mass flow rate of the hot fluid. How's that going to change my temperature distribution? Let's say the mass flow rate of the hot fluid goes up, it gets doubled, tripled, times four. I mean, you're starting to really put the pumps to it and really whip it through. Does uh, the red line change? How would it change if it did change? Would the blue line change? How would it change? Let's say you turn, it's now 10 times. Oh, there's no limit to this. 100 times the flow rate. 100 times the flow rate. Got it? You're really whipping a lot of fluid, hot fluid through there. What happens to the red line? It's going gonna, it's gonna to creep up and up and up as the mass flow rate of the hot fluid goes up. True? And then you're going to be pumping so much hot fluid through it that, oh, you'll have a small decrease in the hot fluid temperature. But it's not a lot. The temperature change because the mass flow rate specific heat is so high. All right. What would happen to the cold fluid as you pumped it up? Would it stay the same outlet temperature? No. Wouldn't it do that? Yeah. Right. So that's, there's a conceptual question. You could turn this around. Leave the hot fluid flow rate alone and just change the cold fluid flow rate. As I originally shown it, where they both approach to kind of come together in the middle, guess what's about the same? Is the mass flow rate of the hot about the same as the mass flow rate of the cold, or is it the mass flow rate of the hot times the specific heat of the hot about the mass flow rate of the cold times the specific heat of the cold? Answer A or B. I say if, the, if, if they're both approaching about the same middle temperature on the outlet, does that mean the mass flow rates are about the same or the mass flow rate specific heats are about the same? Um, let me do this. Uh, could I have uh, water flow for the hot fluid and could I have air flow for the cold fluid? Could I? Sure. There's nothing... And the heat exchanger says, oh no, if you have water on one side, you have to have water on the other. It's very common to have a liquid on one side and a gas on the other. All right, somebody say, uh, give me the specific heat of water from memory. You already gave me the specific heat of air from memory. 1,000 joules per kilogram Kelvin. How about for the water? 4,200 joules per kilogram Kelvin. Or did I botch it? Do you agree or not? Let me do this. Let me see how many, well, I don't know how to ask a clicker question on this. Give me a thumbs up if you agree. Look reasonable? Maybe you remember 1.005 kilojoules per kilogram degree C. Is there any difference for air? You know, 1.005 kilojoule? I just put it as 1,000 joules per kilogram Kelvin. All right, so this is about a factor of, I don't know, here's a clicker question, a factor of 1, a factor of 4, a factor of 10, or a factor of 40. This is a confidence rebuilder. Answer A, B, C, or D. This is a confidence rebuilder here. So what, I, what I've done is I've proven that there are some people who don't call me friend. Uh, they, they're, they're, just not, they're not going to call me a friend. That's it. That's all. It's a factor of four people. One to 4.2 or 1,000 to 4,200, right? So what did I do to torque two people off? I don't know. But anyway, uh, there you go. We could have where the specific heats are a factor of four difference. Easy. Just have water and air. Does that mean that if I put in the mass flow rate 
of uh, 10 kilograms per second and the mass flow rate of 10 kilograms per second, that they would all kind of go to the middle temperature? Nope. Uh, if I put in a mass flow rate of 10 kilograms per second for the air, the cold fluid, what would I have to put in for the mass flow rate of the hot fluid in order for it to kind of go to the middle? How about I work it, you work it out, I'm going to walk around. All right, so a lot of people are coming in with what? Four point what? They put a 10 and they divide by 4.2. What does that come in at? Two point? I can't remember. What did it come in at? 2.4-ish. 2.4. So if I put in a flow rate of 2.4 kilograms per second for the water with its specific heat, and I put it at 10 kilograms per second for the air with its specific heat, uh, I anticipate the curves be pretty symmetric. And meet, you know, they're the, depending how long the heat exchanger is, they could still be quite a far apart before when they hit the end of the heat exchanger. It could be a short heat exchanger or very long. So the best answer for this original question was B. I already graded it, didn't I? That's what? This one, I needed the grade B there, right? Very good. All right, so guess what? They have a name for the product of M dot times C because often you compare the, not just the specific heat, not just the flow rate, the product of them. They call that cap C. They give it a name. I didn't name it. It's called the heat capacity rate. The heat capacity rate. And so you'll see, oh, the heat capacity rate of the cold fluid. Oh, the heat capacity rate of the hot fluid. Cap C is the heat capacity rate. Okay, so the heat capacity rate was defined as something. Oh, man, he just told me it was on the previous slide, but I forgot. Now he needs to answer this question. What is the SI units for the heat capacity rate? Is it kilojoules, kilojoules per Kelvin? Kilowatts, kilowatts per Kelvin, or some other units. SI. We'll give you enough time for you to individually work this one out. All right, so let's pick it up here. It was the product of the mass flow rate times the specific heat, and we just went through those units kilogram per second, kilojoules per kilogram degree C. You cancel those. You're left with uh, kilowatts per degree C, but you know this is a temperature change, so it's just as well kilowatts per Kelvin. And the best answer is D. Everybody on board? All right. So now let's talk about saying concentric tube. I know it looks like this, but instead of trying to draw it very complicated, I'll just put the wall that separates the hot stream from the cold stream, like this, hot and then cold. Now, that's our very general description of the concentric tube. But here, we're going to go from 0 to L in the X, so that's finite length concentric tube heat exchanger. But this time, we're going to have parallel flow. Uh, we already did parallel flow, didn't we? Well, parallel flow, okay, we're going to change that to consent, um, to counter flow. Counter flow. If it's counter flow, this is the hot in that's still the hot out, but over here, let me change it to different color, is the cold in and the cold out. And what's neat about this one is that you can get the hot fluid, if you have it really, really long, to really have a significant drop in temperature. And you can get the cold fluid to come up in temperature. And then if you compared the temperature cold out with the temperature hot out, you can get a flip. Where before, if it was parallel flow, there was no way. There was no way that they could have 
but you can have for here the temperature cold out can be greater than the temperature hot out it doesn't have to be i mean the actual heat exchanger may look like this with the hot fluid doing this and the hot out is still greater than the cold out but if it's especially if it's long enough the cold out can be warmer than the hot out so there's a lot of heat exchangers which are counterflow okay this clicker question is still valid I've written four equations right here, A, B, C, and D. One of them is incorrect. One of them is wrong. Which one is wrong? All right, so let's go ahead and stop. What we found was that this one gives us a negative Q. The others are all positive. And why is it negative? Is it because mass flow rate specific heat are negative? No, it's because the temperature hot out is greater than the temperature cold, I'm sorry, cold out is greater than the cold in, isn't it? So this one is the wrong one. And there it is. Okay. <clears throat> so we already just talked about the counter flow heat exchanger. Again, let me quickly sketch it for the temperature profile. You can have the hot coming this way. You could have the cold doing this. They can be different slopes. They can uh, have a bunch of different cases. And you can start to play a lot of games with this. And there's almost no end to the number of games. So you say for the counterflow concentric tube heat exchanger, if either I say L changes, oh, let L increase, decrease, whatever but let's just say l increases no no let u increase no let the mass flow rate of the hot increase see what i can do i can ask so many questions you can get uh, really um, confused no no you learn a lot how does the temperature hot out change or how does the temperature cold out change or how does the the q the amount of heat transferred within this device the rate of heat transfer how does that change so uh, will it go up, will it negligible, negligible change, or will it go down? See all these? So let's do, the, let's do maybe an easy one. If the mass flow rate of the hot fluid, I'm going to increase that. Boom. Everything else remains the same. The length the same, the U the same, the mass flow rate of the cold. Uh, how does the temperature of the hot out change? Give it a minute, it'll come back. How many minutes do you want to give it, Professor? I don't know. Be patient. And the clicker sessions, huh? We've lost connection. Well, I'm only going to give it a few more seconds, and we're going to have to stop and abandon the clickers. It'll come back up, you think? <laughs> Please check. Okay, we're done with that. Sorry. You're trying to get a point. All right, so now we have to continue this because of technology failure here. So uh, we'll just do it with a show of hands. Temperature hot out. Will it uh, go up? Will the hot out, which is over here, will it go up a little bit? And maybe the new temperature hot profile look like that if you increase the mass flow rate of the hot fluid? Yes? All correct? That's perfect. I, there was nobody didn't have their hand up. Every hand was up. We are now 100% correct. Now, we're going to stay there with the mass flow rate of the hot is going to be increased. What happens to the temperature of the cold out? Where is the temperature of the cold out? Right here, temperature of the cold out. Remember, it's counterflow. What happens to the temperature of the cold out? Who would like to give me their answer verbally? Go ahead. It would increase a little bit? And why would it increase a little bit? You didn't sign up for that. You just wanted to get in. 
Uh, do you have an answer for that one, or should I give it to somebody else? Somebody else. I mean, he's, he's willing to share the glory here. Who would like to say why it would go up a little bit? Yes, sir. Because the temperature is hot. Yeah, you're looking at the average delta T throughout the heat exchanger. And by pushing the hot up, you've uh, created a larger overall delta T for the whole heat exchanger. Hence, there's a larger Q. And so it's going to bring up. It, basically, you've, you had to answer this question first. Uh, I think the Q is going to go up because of the increase. And, and now that it's gone up, uh, then the cold flow rate didn't change. Hence, the cold outlet temperature has to change. Right. There's three equations that you're going to work with in this chapter. Q is equal to cap C hot temperature change of the hot. Q is equal to cap C cold temperature change of the cold. And the one that we haven't gotten to, Q is equal to UA some appropriate best average delta T throughout the heat exchanger. That appropriate delta T is called the LM delta T. It's the log mean temperature difference through that heat exchanger. Intuitively, if the temperature difference throughout is, is large throughout the heat exchanger, delta T log mean is large. Okay? Okay. So kind of this is your logic that, you know, kind of this average delta T throughout the heat exchanger is increased. These are, you know, maybe change the U a little bit because you increase the H on the hot side. Probably you improve the convection coefficient on the hot side. Maybe improve U a little bit. But the, the, you're going to lead to a larger Q because of a larger Q, a larger delta T. Two of these are energy balance equations, conservation of energy. This is why we take a whole class in heat transfer. It is our rate equation. There was a rate equation for heat conduction. What was the name of the rate equation for heat conduction? Fourier's law. There was a rate equation for convection heat transfer. What was the name? Newton's law of cooling. There was a rate equation for radiative heat transfer. Stefan Boltzmann law. And this is just a rate equation like a modified uh, convection equation for uh, the rate of heat transfer in heat exchangers. All right. Um, I'm kind of getting tired, and we have to do our quiz, so we'll stop here and pick up there next time.